Stone carving is an age-old process that dates back to the dawn of mankind. Making something like an arrowhead required the shaping tool to have a harder surface than the stone it was impacting. The discovery and development of iron was the game changer. Hammers, chisels, and saws were able to cut through stone properly without breaking, and the tools were tempered to withstand the stone carver's use. Since this discovery, the stone carver's tools haven't changed significantly until the invention of pneumatics in the 19th century. In America, journeyman stone cutters held an important place in the building of our major cities. Their attention to detail has created everything from iconic statues to ornate gargoyles. The stone carving trade of today isn't dependent on advances in modern technology. The stroke, repetition, and accuracy of the carver's trained hand is a skill passed down over the centuries and still remains the qualifying mark of each craftsman's vision. I'm on my way to visit a stone carver. Walter Arnold loves gargoyles, and so do I. Let's go see what he's up to today. What brought you into carving in stone and working with stone? I don't have a good answer because it happened. It was a decision that was so early in my life. Because by the time I was 12, I knew I wanted to do sculpture and I wanted to work stone. And everyone said, it's a dead art. You, no one does it anymore. You can't learn it. There's no reason to do it. But I was very stubborn. Well, so tell me about it. What did you do? How did you do it? Well, I spent my teenage years basically um, there was what was called urban renewal, which basically meant tear down old buildings in Chicago and then leave empty lots for 30 years because they didn't get around to developing them. Right, okay. So there was a lot of that going on near where I was. So I could go a block away from my house with a red wagon and find a piece of Indiana limestone and haul it home. And then um, my father had a whole wood shop and such in the basement. So I'd sort of use some of his screwdrivers and wood chisels and mess up a lot of his tools trying yeah. to, because just to find out what the tools are. There are a lot of books on sculpture technique. There aren't really books on carving technique because of that differential. The sculptors were the educated people who wrote books. The carvers were the workmen in the stone mills or on construction sites who did the carving and okay. learned from their grandfathers and didn't write it down. So it's very hard to find out what were the correct tools and to find the tools. But I was sort of trying to figure it out on my own, doing portrait busts of friends of mine in these blocks of stone and did that all through my teenage years and really realized I was trying to reinvent the wheel, that I needed to find people who knew how to carve the traditional way. First went to the National Cathedral in Washington when I was about 16 or 17 and tried to get a job there and got blown off, of you course. <laughs> um, but then I ended up tracking down that if there was anything going on, it was in Italy near Carrara where the marbles quarried. I went there when I was 20 oh my gosh. and talked my way into a shop, initially working with two men who between the two of them had 110 years experience. <laughs> um, you know, both of them had started carving for their family shops when they were 11 or 12 years old. After a number of years working in Italy with them and then with other shops over there and other carvers and sculptors there, I came back and then I did get on at the National Cathedral. Where did you go after that? I came back to Chicago and set up my shop. It was, you know, more interesting and better for my interest and my learning to be out on my own. And at that point, I looked around, I thought, you know, I could really move anywhere to start up. But Chicago, I decided on both because I had my roots here and connections with people, and Chicago has always been such a strong city for architecture and for stone in architecture that it was a very good place for this. There's not a whole lot of people in life that can say they really knew what they wanted to do when they were 12. You know, when I was 12, I think I either wanted to be Evil Knievel or a cowboy. I guess what's so special about Walter, though, is that he was able to map out his journey through life. What's happening today in, in the world for stone carvers? Do you see a resurgence in it? There certainly is, just in the last 20 or 30 years, much more interest and taste in handmade work and demand for it. We've got a small group, the Stone Carvers Guild, and we've tried to pull together a lot of the carvers around the country. 
one advantage of the Stone Carvers Guild is we've got a network of people around the country who know each other and know each other's capabilities. So if I get a job that is way too big for one person, you know, I can make a few calls and get two or three other people and sub things out and vice versa. They'll call me to help them on projects. How many projects do you work on at any given time? There's usually at least half a dozen going on, but they're all at different phases. Some will be at the design phase, some I'll have then done the design, ordered the stone, and it might take me two to six weeks to get the stone. So in between I'll be working on other things and overlap them all. What's your favorite thing to carve? It's usually the piece I'm working on at the moment, but I especially like gargoyles. Yeah. Simply because much of what I do is very structured. It's like classical music where you're working from a score. You do all the drawings, meet with clients, work everything out in detail before I execute. Gargoyles are more improvisational, so it's more like jazz. So it's taking the skills and then letting go of them and playing with them and seeing things in the stone and changing as I go. Do you, when you look at a block of stone, do you call it a block or a billet? Yeah, or a block. A block. So when you look at a block of stone, do you see an image of what you're going to end up with? There are really two approaches people have when working, when carving in stone. There's the one where they take a piece of stone and keep working until they find something in it, mm -hmm. and most of the modern abstract work is that way. Okay. Or there's the much more traditional work where you have your design and then you get a piece of stone to fit the design and carve it into there. Do you use both techniques or do you favor one? I work more with having a piece planned out and then find a stone to fit it in. But on some, especially some of the gargoyles, I might, my whole design. On these pieces on the fireplace, I probably had 10 minutes of design work on each one. Oh. If the, actually, probably less than that. Because all I did, I had the piece of stone, I looked at it, I you know, figured I'd do a figure, I took a pencil, okay, a face can go here, the arm can go there, the leg, and essentially that was my design phase. Do you do a lot of fireplaces? 2007, 2008, for some reason, people started building big houses with lots of fireplaces in them. Yeah. Before that, I was probably doing eight or ten fireplaces a year. These are a good example of how I feel about sculpture. People think of sculpture as being shape and form. It's really light and shadow, not shape and form. Light and shadow are what I'm working with. So I'm working with creating highlights, creating shadows. That's what the whole thing is. And those are what give it the shape. Okay. But that's really, you're really working with light and sculpting with light in doing this. And these pieces, I think, are good examples where you can see what I've done with catching edges, creating shadows. And that's what gives it the curve and the life and the movement. So do you think about your legacy a lot? A little bit. I mean, this is a field where you do work that's going to be around for hundreds of years. Yeah. When I was first in Italy, when I was 20 or 21 years old, I heard about this cemetery in Genoa, the Campo Santo di Stalieno. It's the largest outdoor museum in Europe. It's an incredible place. It's the largest collection anywhere of late 19th, early 20th century Italian marble sculpture. This place has pieces, absolute masterpieces, that if any of these were in a museum, they'd be the centerpiece of the collection. And there are hundreds and thousands of these, absolutely breathtaking work. And I've seen the work just deteriorate because the city doesn't have funding to maintain it as a museum or as artwork. They only have funding to maintain it as a working cemetery. Ended up setting up a nonprofit, and we're finding sponsors to sponsor the restoration of sculptures. It'll only be a drop in the bucket if we can do two, three, four a year out of the you know, thousands of works here, but at least it's bringing a little more attention sure. to it and also getting a little more attention in Italy. So they're realizing that if Americans value this, maybe it is an international treasure and legacy. Hey, what do you think about uh, maybe doing some work, getting dirty a little bit? Sure. I love tools. I'd love to learn more about it and check out your workshop. Walter, we're in your workshop, and this is a pretty amazing place. I mean, you've, uh, you've got stone everywhere, you've got all these, these different statues and heads and just all kinds of stuff going on, and you've got a little bit of a dust problem. I'm not sure if you know that or not. 
No There's problem. There's dust everywhere. There's no problem. As long as I'm making <laughs> dust, I'm earning a living. That's right. You're making dust, you're making money, and you're creating. That's awesome. This is good dust. It's pure calcium carbonate. It's like breathing Rolaids. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah? So you don't wear any type of filtration mask or anything? No, I was born with this face. <laughs> <laughs> You've got all kinds of tools around. Can you show me some of them? Basically, you know, I've got hundreds of chisels, but it really comes down to three chisels. Okay. So you use a point chisel to tear off a lot of stone. Go to a tooth chisel to shape and model the forms to round it down, and then to a flat chisel for the fine detailing and finishing. Really? Now, within each one, there's infinite variations. Some of the flats are curved, so they're gouges. There are tooth chisels that are much bigger than this. There are some that are smaller than this. How long do these last? Uh, this one, you see the shape on the end is a little different. I use a handheld pneumatic hammer for most of this, and the pneumatic hammer came in in the late 1880s. Now this chisel, like I said, it's about 100 years old, but it was given to me 1983 by a carver named Carl Fry. He was 88 at the time, gave me all his tools. When he was just coming out of his apprenticeship, 1925, 26, he worked on the Chicago Tribune Tower. And in the 80s, I was doing a lot of restoration carving for the Tribune, replacing pieces that were damaged. Okay. And so when I was doing that, I was using tools that belonged to the guy who did it in the first place, one of the guys. So That's amazing. It's really a feeling, not that I'm out here now doing this all on my own. I'm doing it all on the shoulders of all the previous generations that developed the knowledge and the technique and the tools, and I'm just carrying that forward. That's just great. Can I see that tool? So this tool's over 100 years old. Yeah. And uh, it's got a ton of history behind it. I can't believe that they last that long, you know, that the stone doesn't just wear this down to, to nothing. Mm -hmm. If you do it right, you know, it's not like wood carvers who are sharpening their tools all day long. Yeah. I might spend a few hours a year sharpening chisels. A few hours a year. You don't want it too sharp, and if you use it right, the steel, the stone doesn't tear up the chisel. So uh, I'm going to make some kind of incredible gargoyle or... We'll do some leaves. Leaves? Yeah. Well, okay. Okay. In nature, the S-curve is always nice. It's pleasant so to the eye. So that'll be the main stem. And you always draw out what you're going to do before usually, you do it? Usually. I don't always do anything because every project's different. <laughs> There's no one... I love your answers. So you start by defining the edge of one of the leaves. And I'm angling away from the leaf so that I chip away I from chip it. chip away from it. So here. I'll give it a shot. Yeah, here. Here's your oh, air valve. Here, hold this, this. Now you can do the... Can I brush it off and see what I did here? Yeah. Fairly close. Now you can do the same thing this way too. It just takes a little longer. You see what I mean where each, yeah. each stroke knocks more off? You know, but your mallets still look worn, so you still must use them and you have oh, a couple yeah. laying around. Oh, always because there are times, especially, I'm going back and forth. I'll do something, stop and draw, do something. If I'm only doing a couple cuts, it's faster to pick this up than to pick that up and turn it Can on. Can I try that? Yeah. This really is pretty, uh, pretty amazing. Next will be find a nice center curve. I can see when I'm doing it, I'm really like gouging, yeah. it feels like. It's because of the way I'm holding the tool? Uh, the angle of the tool, the way, both the angle, two, there's a couple things going on. There's the angle this way and the angle this way. There are so many different things going on because the way you're holding the tool, the way you're holding the hammer, the angle that you're holding things in, and, and uh, you know, there's so many different techniques going on. It's, mm -hmm. I could see why this is so challenging to, to learn and to pick up.
Like watching so many of our other craftsmen on this show, Walter made carving stone look so easy. He picked up a chisel, he would pick up his pneumatic hammer, and go in and carve out a leaf, and it just was so cool watching him do it because it happened so fast. And then I went to try it, and it was a totally different experience. I was just hacking away at the stone, and it didn't look like a leaf at all. Well, it's now, getting better. Now you want to use the, where's a nice one? Hey, how do you feel about all these, these different heads looking over you every day? Well, a lot of those, there are five of those are limestone pieces I did when I was a teenager. Which ones? Well, the real white ones are plaster models, plaster casts. Okay. Um, but the more gray ones, the one with the square background, and these four are all heads I did of friends of mine when I was a teenager. So these are the ones you were telling me about yeah. earlier? and that hand on the left, I was 16 when I did that one. Wow. What about this one on the end here? Um, that one I was about probably 18 or 19. So that's pretty cool that, yeah. you know, you made these when you were a yeah. teenager, when you were first yeah. starting out, and they're watching you like every day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whose hand was that? Was that anybody's? That was... Yours? Yeah. Holding a tennis ball. What about that white piece right there? Uh, that's an interesting one. Um, that's a wonderful piece of statuary marble from Mount Altissimo in Italy, which is the mountain where Michelangelo got his marble. Super, really? Superb marble. I had a friend who... Um, his father in World War II had been a partisan fighter up in those mountains, and a guy who was in his father's company, you know, partisan fighting group, was worked for the company that owned the quarry as a caretaker on the mountain, lived up there um, to keep track of it and keep trespassers out. So he went up there, had a glass of wine with him, and then he took <laughs> me out, you know, where they'd saw up the marble, the little chips, which are pieces this big, they just toss over the side. So we went there and we were picking out pieces of stone from the pile there. And I brought a hammer, you know, nice, the roughing out hammer that I'd been taught to use. In fact, it was this one here. Soft iron, the head of the chisel is tempered, because that way this absorbs a little bit of the blow. You get a certain rhythm okay. to it where you really pop the stone. So I brought that with so I could test out the stone and get the feel of the different pieces because they'd been out there in the weather. And I'd test out pieces, picked some, and we had a little Fiat 500. <laughs> so we're loading some pieces in there. This big truck that belonged to the quarry comes lumbering down the mountain. The guy slammed on his brakes on this dirt road, which skidded for a while before he stopped. Jumped down. We're worried because, you know, we're not supposed to. We are past the no trespassing signs. Sure. So he jumped out. What are you doing? My friend said, oh, he's an American sculptor. We're just picking out some scrap model, stone. He looked at what he and said, that's not a sculptor's hammer. That's a quarryman's hammer because this is the type they use in the quarries for squaring it. Okay. The fact that I had that hammer and knew how to use it. Showed respect. So he said. Can I see that? Yeah, he said, you're not getting any of that stone down there in that little Fiat. Come on, I'm going as far as such and such a place, which is four kilometers from where we were going. Throw some in the back of the truck. <laughs> so we loaded a bunch in the back of the truck. We're following him down this winding mountain road. It's right, you know, the edge. There's the mountain road and drops off. Of course, he's kicking up loads of dust, so we're just basically following the cloud of dust to try to follow him. Suddenly, we come to a town, which means three buildings right. on the side of the mountain. He whips over to the shoulder, you know, with this, which means the wheels are this far from the edge. Yeah. Whips over to the shoulder, slams on the brakes, so we pull over behind him. He's already jumped out and is hidden across. There's a little cafe there, a little bar. By the time we get in, he's got glasses of wine lined up for everybody. <laughs> now, of course, they're doing me this favor, getting me the marble, so I start to reach for the my so wallet. Right. He grabs my arm and said, this is my town. I pay for the wine. Oh. So he not only delivered the stone. He bought you a drink. He bought me a drink. That's a great a story. Drink. We got to the shop where I was working and put, we, we then we had to shuttle it a couple trips in the Fiat 500 to get it the rest <laughs> of the way. So we get to the shop. I ask, you know, lead carver I'm working with to help. I said, we were up at the quarry. has got some scrap stone. Can you help me unload it? I start handing him the first piece. He almost drops and says, because you know what you're looking at. You know, when you see this stuff, he knew from the grain, the color that was out. He said, wait, 
this is Altissimo. How do you get this stuff? I said, oh, we went up above Cerevet, so we went up this road, went this way. He said, you came to a gate with a sign that said, Vietato l'ingresso, which means forbidden entry. And I said, yes, what did that mean? <laughs> <laughs> so he said, well, I won't tell anyone if you give me a piece. <laughs> so anyway, it's incredible stone. You can see how much can be done with it. How long did you work with tools like that? I was really using this a lot for my first year. You were? Yeah. It looks like it's got a lot of wear to it. I mean, look at that. Oh, the, core, the, the guys in the quarries who would just square off, because back then they'd split a block in half and you'd have to square it all by hand, they'd wear down like a deep thumb-like hole in there, and every time they'd hit, it would catch the exact point. Oh, really? One of the guys I worked with was great with this tool, the roughing out. He was really known for how fast he could rough out. And he'd be up there working like that with the chips flying. And then a tourist would come poke their head in the door of the shop. So he'd let them stay there for a minute, minute and a half, till he figured they'd been there long enough. And then you couldn't see anything different than what he was doing. But instead of the chips going that way, <laughs> they were going that way, and the people would leave. <laughs> That's great. And he'd also, sometimes I'd come by, he'd be talking. So he's working then. You know, he knew where the stone, he knew exactly. he knew where the stone was, what he's doing. Can I see that? That's very different. It's just a spike. Temper, it's tempered on both ends, though. Mm -hmm. Tempered here, and this is soft. Right. So it absorbs the blow, so all the force goes in a very short period of time, and you need that snap to it. To get that rhythm to going? To get it to really pop. That's wonderful. Walter, thank you so much for having us out today. I really appreciate it. I had a great time. I've never done anything like this before, so it was really uh, pretty amazing. Well, it was my pleasure. It was fun. It's always good to have people know and understand this because the more they understand it, the more they see what's around them. You, know, you live in a city with carvings done 100 years ago and never look at it, but once you understand what it is, you start seeing it and enjoying it. One of the things Walter mentioned to me when I was working with him was look up. And I've thought about it a lot since. We really need to take more time and pay attention to the buildings around us because that's the stone carver's legacy. And that's Walter Arnold's legacy.